Welcome to Buy the Bywater, a podcast on the Megaphonic Network. I'm Ned Raggett. I'm Oriana Schwint. I'm Jared Pekachak. And we're here to talk about all things J.R.R. Tolkien. His work, his inspirations and impact, creative interpretations in other media, languages, lore, ripoffs, parodies, anything we think is interesting. Thanks for joining us. Hello and welcome to the 26th episode of By the Bywater. Glad to have you back with us once again. We're glad to be here. We can all say, as we were just talking beforehand, that we are now fully vaccinated. How great for us. Yay. <laughs> and we hope that you all are getting that too. Again, speaking mainly, I guess, to our U.S. folks, we know not everyone everywhere quite has it so good, um, as the news will tell you. But uh, certainly uh, we hope everything's going well uh, for everyone as they can be. I am looking forward to an week week's time seeing my parents for the first time in a year <laughs> so, a little overdue <laughs> so, yeah. but you know think things got away from us so hey, yeah that reminds me jared you did finally see your niece or nephew i can't remember who who arrived last year niece uh and, niece yeah Aww. no i saw her month or two after she was born but i haven't seen her since oh okay Aww. so we'll see but um i don't think that her parents are vaccinated yet she's mm. certainly not and I don't, you know, you wouldn't, but yeah, I was about um, to say <laughs> it's probably yeah. going to be a little while before I see them maskless. Oh, mm -hmm. well, so. well, at least you have seen her, so you, you yeah. you're one up on me there. So and 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 all. So, but uh, anyway, we do hope uh, for the best for everyone. We hope things are settling down, as mentioned. Uh, yes, I've been. What's happening this month? It was doing the taxes and doing the things. I could go on, but we're not a podcast of general complaints. We hope you're all getting through your own general ones. We do They're want to send our best. specific complaints. Yeah. Yeah. So. yeah. Darn it. Yeah. Well, we have, we have thoughts about news and things. We'll get to that in a second. But we do want to absolutely, you know, on a slightly serious note, send our best uh, to our, you know, uh, megaphonic crew all up in Ontario because it's not mm. good there. We have no. been seeing the news on that. And uh, absolute best to, uh, to Chris, Mike, and everyone up there. Um, ugh, and all that. So, uh, yeah, you know, again, when you're when when you're lucky enough with uh, your political leaders, uh, think be be grateful for what you got, because some of the ones are not so good. <laughs> so we'll leave it at that because, oh, man, that'd be a rant on its own right. Yeah, um, it's so complicated, too. It's like, yeah, it yeah. really, really is. Hey everyone, Ned here. This is an after-the-fact edition that we forgot to mention something else about what our compatriots in Megaphonic are doing, namely that the podcast The Spouter Inn just had an episode a few days ago on Fellowship of the Ring. Spouter Inn is the wonderful general literature podcast on the Megaphonic Network, uh, co-hosted by Chris and Suzanne, and you really should check it out in general. But yes, they did do an episode specifically focusing on the wonderfulness that is the Fellowship of the Ring in particular, as part of a series of uh, podcast episodes looking at questions of land in literature. Also, there's a special bonus episode that they're doing, which may be out by the time that this episode drops, that is being done with Oriana, talking more about Fellowship and Tolkien in general. So be on the lookout for both of those. Do check out The Spatter Inn, as well as the rest of the wonderful podcasts on the network here. And as always, just keep an eye out. There's all sorts of fun things going on. Thanks, and back to the episode. So, uh, but in any event, uh, it is spring, it has sprung, there is some news actually to talk about, sort of, kind of, so I'll just turn it over to Jared to read it, so as always, please do take it away. So there's still nothing to show yet from the Amazon series, which is funny given the money supposedly spent on it, uh, per pieces in stuff, The Hollywood Reporter and elsewhere, all drawing on comments from Stuart Nash, um, New Zealand's Minister for Economic Development and Tourism. The first season apparently has a budget of around $460 million, an amount that even overshadows the various individual Marvel series on Disney Plus in terms of cost, much less something like Game of Thrones. Sharon Taliguado, a former Amazon Studios exec, has since tweeted that this is, to use an ever tiresome phrase, fake news. But whatever the exact figures, there's little doubt this is a massive investment on Amazon's part. 
Uh, oddly enough, another Amazon Tolkien project, the planned Lord of the Rings MMORPG, announced. I, I can't. I can't not enunciate that like that. I don't know. I've always done that. I'm sorry. Uh, Morp. 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 Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> announced two years, uh, years ago um, has been formally canceled following contract disputes between Amazon and Tencent, the Chinese entertainment giant who recently acquired the video game holding company Amazon had originally created the deal with. There's been some comments that given Amazon's track record with games in general via its own development house, that's probably a good thing, but we'll leave that to the hardcore gamers to debate. Yes, please. I have no idea. Yeah. <laughs> what has Amazon been up to? <laughs> yeah, I completely forgotten about that thing. <laughs> I I don't know anything about, I didn't even realize Amazon has a game development Arm? They must be doing great if you've never heard of it. Yeah, yeah the, the one comment I read was something about how, like, here are their games. They're not much. And I'm like, hmm. <laughs> so, it's their money laundering arm or something. <laughs> that explains where they, got, where they got the money. So speaking of the money. So, yeah, speaking we have thoughts money. about the, uh, the TV series there. So, like, you know, I, 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 it, it really is the most expensive TV series of all time, it seems. At least so I mean, far. this rivals, like, you know, the biggest budget block blockbusters you've ever heard of like you know the final season of game of thrones which is widely you know it was eight episodes and it cost a hundred million dollars that is unheard of so we don't even know how many episodes the amazon series is <laughs> and they're building a full-size numenor that's right <laughs> they're building an island to sink it yeah are absolutely. you building and sinking the island of numenor is that what's happening here what <laughs> what, well, what could even you possibly... what did the, what was the budget for the jackson trilogy it was not that no uh, yeah that's actually that's a good um let's see you have what... to do yeah inflation adjustments and things like that so but uh comparable i guess you know yeah, i'd have to think about that one so yeah the, the, i just gotta remember that number i mean yeah a lot <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, is what one it is assumes, yeah. i don't know i mean it's not maybe not too surprising considering the original uh well, actually, maybe it is. The more I think about it, the actual rights deal was two hundred and fifty million. This is twice as much as that, practically. <laughs> These, pe this is this is a three quarters of a billion dollars almost on a season of television. This is the kind of thing where, as like, can you just give this money? To the poor? Do you have to? Right? I don't need Lord of the Rings content this badly. Okay, well, I was just thinking, like, you know, among the many, you know, other comments, uh, a Twitter friend of mine, so personal connection, I can't claim this is, you know, from on high, but it's a good one, a guy named Ben Boyer, who's worked in UK TV and other things like that. He was saying, like, you know, man, just create a, like, a little seed program where you just give money to a certain established directors to do their uh, intentionally mid-range budget passion projects or things they've been wanting to do for a while just because you get some more original good art he was comparing to like something like john waters uh, fruitcake which he's had on the back burner now for over a decade mm -hmm. and as waters himself has said yeah you know it's a choice between you know the studios only want these huge blockbusters and i'm not going to do something on a micro indie budget that's not what i do i need something in the middle but there's no middle <laughs> so you know it's yeah. just ugh, it's it's insane oh it just feels immoral it <laughs> it does it does <laughs> not to drag it down but like that's that doesn't deserve this much money right well what could you what what could you possibly be do like i know that there's you know infinite ways to use money mm. but like you know i was talking with my husband who like worked on some shows at a sort of digital media outlet and he was working on shows that were sort of you know like travel type shows and you know their budgets like they had to find ways to spend the budget and this mm. is fairly small rinky dink stuff how do you how do you spend 460 million dollars how do you spend 400 million dollars how do you spend 200 million dollars yeah. like it just beggars belief it's like is this a money laundering thing <laughs> what's I mean, I've been reading the new book that came out about Nixium, and it's one of those things where, like, you know, <laughs> if there was an ultimate sort of like scam going on here, it wouldn't surprise me at this point. <laughs> it just sort of like we're missing something. <laughs> you know, was are they are, did they build entirely new facilities in 
what was well, it's there... like you look at the set photo it's, you know quote set photos it's like a tarp and some yeah. like there's not you can't hide 450 or 60 million dollars right. behind that what is going on yeah yeah i mean i i i had a hunch of just a hunch right now maybe a flash of insight quote unquote but maybe they're just you know they've got it so well set up that the lack of tourism happening for fairly obvious reasons as things going on is that somehow i don't want to say everyone's bought into the idea of like oh yeah you know we'll keep it low key over there but that may be a factor because we're joking about geez where all the money's going well i'm not saying it's all going there but you know the reason why it was announced by a government minister is that they're going yeah sure we'll happily take your money so they just bought new zealand <laughs> Yeah, if you got a bunch Basically. of yeah, if you got a bunch of people who are well paid and just sort of like doing things like yeah, sure and all that. If they are well paid, God knows, you know, they have plenty of questions. There are plenty of things to ask here. It's just sort of like you know they're all going like oh yeah, we'll hide your you know exact you know one to one recreation of Rivendell from the from the uh, you know valley we've carved out of the mountain over here or something <laughs> like that or whatever it's going on. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. They're growing actual hobbits in vats. What is like... the GDP of New Zealand? That's a good question. Oh, man. Maybe Bezos bought the place. Maybe he owns the North Island now. <laughs> yeah. Let's see. So GDP in New Zealand is expected to reach $196 billion by the end of 2020. So, like... Yeah. Okay. All right. It's a, 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 a chunk of change, but it's not like half the budget or anything like that. Yeah, so, it's yeah. not... It's not as though it is the entirety of New Zealand that they have bought, but that is still, I don't know. Yeah. I guess so like we're kind of required to watch at least an episode when it comes out, <laughs> yeah. I feel like, right? I don't know, man. It feels kind of gross. There's like no way it's going to be good too, right? I mean, at this point. <laughs> I, I mean, I really don't know. I mean, I will say this, you know, the, the one person who can actually be relied on to give, you know, at least recently enthusiastic comments about what's going on, I'm glad of it. They keep asking her because she's always doing other projects, being interviewed things, is Morvid Clark. Um, yeah. There was another There was another brief uh, interview, uh, a couple snippets of things from her in a wider interview, I guess uh, something to do with uh, more of some of the other work she's doing. But the subject of it came up and she said something like, you know, every so often I just sort of like, oh, it's going on here. But then I'm like, I'm I'm wearing these amazing costumes and I'm getting to do all this. You know, just, mm -hmm. you know, we'll just see. And, you know, she was kind of coy about whether there is a full five season commitment or not. So, I mean, something is going on. And then there was whatever that, you know, the studio head we mentioned uh, in the news piece. Mm -hmm. She was saying that it's, you know, not the case. So is someone counting the numbers differently? Is this an apprehension? I mean, and she's ex Amazon studio. Studio, so it's not like she's protecting them right now. So if she, you know, if she wanted to badmouth them, she could. She's not. Yeah. So it's one of those things. Like, yeah, I don't know. It, well, wait, didn't it, she move from the she moved from the gaming division to the show? Uh, no, I don't think so. She. Yeah, she left. Apparently, she left the studio role in 2019. So it's uh, so it's sort of like you know. Now she may be doing something else with Amazon. I don't know. Yeah, I didn't check that. It, that's one of those things where it's very, very rare to hear people talk negatively about anyone in the industry it's just oh you mean like how scott rudin only got cod to account now mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah mm -hmm. that's exactly what i am referring to uh it is it is very difficult to get people to you know you you work with everyone and they all it's kind of like a game of musical chairs at the executive level at all of these studios they all just kind of switch around <laughs> like i believe it well you know well tune in again next month where we complain about no photos <laughs> and no nothing and anything from the series <laughs> I mean, at this point we are nothing if not consistent <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah I, I can't wait we'll have been halfway through 2021 the year when this series is still supposed to come out and we'll almost certainly still have nothing <laughs> It's so, Ugh. all of this is just so hinky. <laughs> I don't understand any of it. Maybe it's a cover. Maybe it's like the Glomar Explorer was in the 70s. Look that up if you want to. I mean, where Howard Hughes was like recruited by the government so they could like did this cover story so they could get the hold of this Soviet submarine or whatever it was they were oh trying God. to get. This oh whole thing, God. this whole thing is a put on and something else <laughs> is happening. And like at, the, at some point, Jeff Bezos has basically come out saying like, and I will show you how I finally defeated Elon Musk and introduced his hyperspace rockets or something. <laughs> Something like that, so we can finally destroy SpaceX. That's what's really going on here, you know, the whole thing. I whoa, I'm into this con conspiracy <laughs> non theory. Like, who am I rooting for in a fight between Bezos and Musk? <laughs> That's Let a quick and painless yeah, death. No, for sure. <laughs>
<laughs> oh God, wow. <laughs> the, the, the world we're in. <laughs> anyway, uh, so again, uh, next month with more non news. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, let's next month's let's episode move. is just this for an hour. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> we, oh, we could go on, <laughs> but uh, we'll spare you uh, <laughs> for now. <laughs> so yeah, we'll have our special episode sometime later. Nothing but venting. Uh, but uh, let's move on to the actual main topic where we're here. That is Oriana's this time. A wonderful choice of topic, an actual serious one, as opposed to wondering about tarps and money and things like that. So, uh, Oriana, do please uh, take us away into your choice of topic this time. So the idea of a hero or heroes going away on an adventure and returning to a house very much out of order is old. Like the Odyssey old, if not older than that. I was trying to think back to the one class I took in college about uh, Mesopotamian theology and literature and couldn't couldn't quite reach far back enough to, to find this trope here. But the scouring of the Shire, the, the penultimate chapter of Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, is not even the first time that Tolkien has used this, mm, let's call it a trope for sort of lack of a better word, mm. because the same thing, of course, happens to Bilbo on his return from the Lonely Mountain. But there's a distinctly modern, and here I mean modern is simply not ancient, uh, flavor to the scouring of the Shire. The forces at work in this chapter are industrialization, the rise of a police state, and cruelty for cruelty's sake, essentially. Which is why it's kind of always bummed me out that Peter Jackson considered this chapter to be, in his own words, quote, anticlimactic. <laughs> it's the denouement of the entire series of course it's not the climax <laughs> it's less of what certain people might consider epic but it's all the more necessary to bring the reader back from the sort of high fantasy world of kings and elves back to the more familiar territory of our world which is the shire here and it's not enough to just bring us back no one can remain unscathed throughout all of the works of Middle Earth runs this theme of essential corruption. No land, no person can truly escape the effects of evil. While this chapter is specifically called out by Tolkien as non-allegorical because people had a field day with it when it came out, it's, you know, based loosely on the sort of annexation of Tolkien's Warwickshire town by industrial Birmingham. But there is a hell of a lot of applicability here. The expansion of a, you know, police state essentially carries notes of Nazi Germany, fascist Italy, Stalin's USSR. You have the ranks of the Shire's sheriffs swell from like a couple in each region uh, to dozens, if not hundreds. I don't think there's an exact number, but mm. there are, sure are a lot of cops <laughs> to enforce these arbitrary rules that induce poverty and misery. The culture of the hobbits, hobbit holes, these beautiful low-storied buildings, agrarianism, chilling out and drinking and eating and smoking has been destroyed. And while I'm sure a number of paleoconservative types love this image of a utopian agrarian society being destroyed by outsiders and retaken and rebuilt. Once again, this material resists a pat political reading. Societies like Stalin's USSR and Nazi Germany were hyper-industrialized, so that doesn't really work here. Fascist ideology is marked by diametrically opposed tenets like a rejection of modernity and a love of new technology that makes the killing of humans more efficient as well as the need for a police state. At any rate, Mary Pippin, Sam, and Frodo return to a shire that has fallen victim to the exact evil they thought they had eradicated. Like Frodo, who did not cast the ring into Mount Doom and thus failed at the one task he had, which <laughs> maybe that's a topic for another time. <laughs> um, but they have sort of failed to protect the shire. And there's like a whole list of other things that I would like to discuss, but... To start with, what do each of you love or not love about the scouring of the Shire? What, what, how do you feel about it? 
Tell, tell me about your feelings. <laughs> mm. That's a good one. I have, hmm. You phrase it that way. I'm not. I'm. I'm not almost sure how best to begin. Jared, do you have a initial thought that sort of you want to build well, on, I, or to sort of shade Jackson a little bit? Um, when I was, you know, twelve or whatever, experiencing this for the first time, I was like. Yeah, I mean, this is a little boring, I guess. It's, you know, the ring is destroyed. Why are we going back here? Mm -hmm. But then as I got older and more mature as a human being, I was like, no, this is like, this is great. This is a really powerful thing, even if it's very quiet. It's this a moment of healing that you don't get until that point, I think. Like you hear about a ton of damage. You he Like you see the battles, you like smoke rising on the borders of Loria and that kind of thing. But the only place that you see repaired rather than just summary, like, Oh yeah, the elves came and made Minas Tirith more beautiful. Like hmm. that's just a thing that is noted in passing, but this is like the actual work of repair yeah. after, after the storm, which is again, really beautiful. And it's something that I think a lot of other things miss by assuming that the story is only the conflict. Like, you know, you watch the Avengers destroy New York or whatever, mm -hmm. but the rebuilding is often treated almost as a joke or a world building element and not as an organic part of the story that's also worth considering. That is, and I think actually, I think the reason why, or one of the reasons, and I'm maybe kind of projecting onto Peter Jackson. He's a useful canvas for that. <laughs> you know, but it's the, when you look at the movies themselves, like one of the differences that I, I didn't quite get until just now almost is, is the extent to which the movies focus on not just the hobbits on, mm -hmm. you know, create on making Aragorn, especially into this protagonist like figure when the books are like ex the books are about the hobbits. Mm -hmm. Everyone else is just kind of tangentially involved. And yeah, you get uh, when everyone is separated and you do, of course, get Aragorn and Legolas's point of view and Gimli. But it is a story about the hobbits. And I think the reason he couldn't find a place for something as essential as the scouring of the Shire is he just didn't see the story as hobbit based as it actually is mm -hmm. if that makes sense mm -hmm. there's um there's an interesting element to jackson's let's say substitution for the scouring uh that uh that i think is you know it, it's his own way of acknowledging world war one you could argue in the same way that clearly tolkien had you know, his own direct processing with it and that's of course the uh the bit in the where they're all wordlessly toasting each other in the end yeah. when they have nothing to say. Mm -hmm. I thought that was actually rather deftly done. I, instead of instead of being, as you know, Bob, we went through all this experience together and we're changed. You know, he they wise, the cut wisely just removes that and says, we don't need to say anything. Really nice. Uh, not the scouring, of course, <laughs> um, it, uh, as it stands, but uh, it, I, that would argue, I would argue for that. But having said that, um, you know, more thoughts about maybe Jackson's riff on that in a bit. I was sort of thinking just now more about the functioning of the scouring and repair, as you say, uh, in the uh, in the narrative. And what's interesting to me is that uh, is that suddenly the gift that Galadriel gives Sam takes on an interesting resonance because it is a gift of repair. Mm -hmm. And we know that Sam has seen in the mirror the what looks to be the destruction that's happening in the Shire, which turns out to, in fact, be the case. So a vision that came true. And it's almost as if that in that moment, she's uh, saying like, uh, you're going to need this, you know, and we don't know why or how we'll need it. And in fact, he forgets about it until Frodo says, hey, wait, what about that one thing? You know, when the time is right and they realize they have this sort of tool there, which is kind of interesting. It, it underplays what turns out to be a very great gift. I I like that it's not as centered you could say in the repair and partially because it is sort of a magic tool when maybe the emphasis is it isn't supposed to be something where you wish you have a talisman to help you through things or you have something to help you doing you've got to be able to do that yourself you know there's there's more to unpack with this but i'm just suddenly sort of thinking about this in this new light but to quickly complete one other thought and then i'll throw it back uh something that's interesting too is that uh is that in the it's the run-up to the scouring that's almost as interesting interesting 
as the scouring because we have what turns out to be a unwarranted dismissal by all our returning heroes of uh, Saruman and Wormtongue on the road when it just is mm-hmm. like, ah, ha, ha, you know, and things like this. And you know, it's sort of like, you know, well, wait a minute, that turned out to be a bad thing. He went back and did yeah. more awful stuff. <laughs> Should you have done that? And the bit where, and this is where I think it's only, the only character who consciously does this and it's interesting, and it's not in the Shire, and that's good old Barlow and Butterbur in Bree, where he's the one who says, hey, we didn't really know how much we missed the Rangers until they left. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, you know, and that is obviously, to a degree, a story of the, the Shire, what happened to the Shire as well, and why it needs a scouring, because that protection was gone as well. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it is interesting that the person who observes that is not, it's not the hobbits themselves. It's not them going like, oh, gee, we didn't know, <laughs> you know, yeah. it, on site. It's someone who, you know, by default is in a place, who plays different place and maybe has a sort of different perspective on it. And, of course, he's the one who sort of warns them, like, yeah, things are different over there now, you know, it's sort of like... Like, you know, a little bit of, you know, good foreshadowing, really. But anyway, just sort of throw that back. The the Shire is uniquely vulnerable. Um, and I do love because so the purpose of the elves existing is to sort of help repair the, you know, or rather one of the reasons that people that some of the Valar are like, no, the elves should be in Middle Earth and they should like help to repair the damage done by Melkor. Mm. Um, and you have that on a, a, a much more micro level here with Sam and his elvish gift working to heal the hurts of this evil, which was able to penetrate the Shire, not just because of, you know, the rangers were gone, but because the its inhabitants are so complacent. Mm. Not just complacent, but you have guys like Lotho Sackville Baggins and then Ted Sandyman as like industrialist scum. <laughs> <laughs> it it is just this nice like hey, danger is everywhere and and it is one of those things where you sh- you kind of do need to be constantly vigilant or else these really damaging thought patterns will invade your society of mm-hmm. of you know taking food away from one group and and not redistributing at all Mm. Uh, a funny thing i was reading through some of the like uh scholarly discussions on on this chapter and i think it's i think it's tom shippey that was talking about the the pipeweed that had been going away to Saruman mm. for for a while and you know what actually happened to it because he certainly wasn't Saruman wasn't like giving the orcs long bottom leaf or anything and my interpretation is like that's that's the cruelty for cruelty's sake is it's it, it's enough to simply deprive these complacent hobbits of one of their comforts you know, and that sort of ties into the comment way back at the beginning of the book, where Gandalf tells Frodo that uh, you know it says that Sauron would couldn't be happier if all the uh, if all the deer hobbits became slaves just because you know yes. it's an extension of that same principle for sure. Sort of going back to Lotho for a second, the impulse I think is to read the story as like you know the story of the ring and like when it's gone evil is defeated and all that but lotho exhibits the same like will to power that is necessary to to be evil essentially in tolkien's world and it's in the middle of being like this redemptive healing sequence it's also like no you guys evil is is not gone like you didn't really win you won this battle the war is still going on Mm -hmm. which is an important thing to say i mean it's a little obvious in some ways but also like chapters here for a reason yeah that's that's one thing that as i get older i come to care less and less about subtlety yeah (laughs) subtext is for coward right (laughs) i i i love how naked like there's not a lot in here that's like hidden or anything it's very like yep uh watch out for Watch out for the evil capitalists. <laughs> Traitors in your own mist. Yeah, like basically. Well, what's also interesting too is that uh, is that Tolkien gives our our four returning heroes, as it were, they're not one person. They mm-hmm. all they all address things based on their own experiences and what they do. So you know, the biggest contrast easily being, of course, between Mary and Pippin are like, wait, we can do something here. What the heck, you know? Yeah. And let's and go off and get they, the swords. Yeah, they they become the captains and so forth and things like this. The ones that turn the tide versus of course um frodo's you could argue it's another failure but i i don't mean it in a in a personal way more just a sense of 
know, he reaches limits. He desperately hopes there's no more death. Yeah. That doesn't happen. <laughs> that doesn't happen down the line. You know, he doesn't even want Saruman dead. And, uh, you know, but it all happens. You know, you could argue that's a function of the narrative uh, having its cake and eating it, too. Yeah, but I think it's actually, you know. He prevents some. He, he keeps it from being a bloodbath. He's yeah. just not yeah. able to prevent all the death that he wants to prevent. Which right. is another sort of bitter, sort of bittersweet part of this. Yeah, I think it like it's it is important to have all of those viewpoints sort of represented. The no, we're gonna take what's ours, and if these people have to die in order for that to happen, we will make that happen. Versus no, we can just tie them up and it'll be okay. <laughs> There's sort of two different ideas of justice at work. There's the kind of retributive, you killed us, we're going to kill you kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Versus Frodo's more like, even if they did a whoopsie, like we shouldn't punish them the way you would think they deserve. I know there's a word for it. Somebody probably knows it and can tell me what it is. But yeah, the not retributive, but like restorative? Is, that's I think restorative right. oh, yeah. justice restorative is what justice. you're thinking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. You know, what's what's kind of funny to me is, so Tolkien died before Margaret Thatcher <laughs> took office, <laughs> and yet I, I think because I, you know, watched The Crown season four, I don't know, maybe a couple months ago or something, and rereading this chapter, all I could think of was Thatcher as Sharky. Like, <laughs> 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 I, you know, it doesn't make it any, uh, that's what I mean by, like, there's so much applicability here, you know, taking, taking such you know, just immiserating wide swaths of people because that's just what you do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, there's something there's something interesting to that in terms of motivation because it sort of it sort of feeds into the idea. It's almost a Dickensian idea. Not that you know Tolkien was much of a Dickens guy, from what I know. That sort of like it's not so much. You know, one can say the system as it is certain bad people and you get rid of them, things get better. You know, the the convenience of the plot is that Lotho is no more. In fact, in one of the more grotesque things, we learned that you know, Worm Tongue literally made of eaten Lotho, which is like, you know, which is really a fairly heavy thing for Tolkien to bring in. Turning it up to 11, yeah, like very... Real very just tossed off too it's like wait what no 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 hold on and you don't know if it's for sure saruman's just like you know he might have done it who cares he's been hungry what? lately hold on there is something to be said, maybe to sort of focus on, you know, the, that grimmest of endings. It's sort of like to 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 have essentially Sar you know, the the last the last battle of the Lord of the Rings fought on the you know doorstep of Bag End or the exact line, uh, however that is in the book. Um, the idea that it is the ending of these two characters who have had you know fairly key roles throughout the the entire story, one way or another. I mean, you know, Saruman is introduced fairly early on, if like second hand through Gandalf. You know, we build up mm -hmm. to his you know eventually appearance of the you know the 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 voice of Saruman confrontation when we finally see him directly and of course worm tongue itself recurs you know throughout and so like and you know it's is there's something to be said about how it's it's hard to say it's a it's not a heroic ending for them of course it isn't at all for either of them you know but it is it is something it is it is it, it's compelling because it's so bitter and turned on itself and yeah. sad you have you have and you have a case arguably i think maybe more than anywhere else in the book i could be wrong of an abuser abused situation yeah. that yeah. ends horribly for all involved and you know and uh you know it's it's you know there, there's dynamics there to unpack it's very interesting that we have this here at that point it's such a, a weird inversion we're kind of getting away from the scouring i guess here but it's a weird inversion uh not inversion but like a dark mirror of um frodo and sam Hmm. where Sam is totally devoted and, like, not fawning, but like, oh, Mr. Frodo, uh, like, that kind of thing. But Frodo treats him as a person and all that. And then, yeah. obviously, Saruman does not think of Wormtongue as a person. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He just wants devotion from somebody. Yeah. And I think that's important. You bring that up. You sort of like, it, it, this is very much a part of the scouring. The scouring does come down to not merely, you know, fixing where everything went bad, but, you know, addressing addressing who's there. And uh, yeah, it's sort of, you know, that's that that does make Saruman's comment about how Frodo has grown. You know, clearly that is the big moral victory and recognition. And Saruman realizes he can't, you know, he's played all his cards. Yeah. <laughs> you know, he, it's, it's sort of like that's 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 all he has. His one last thing he attempts to do is to try and stab Frodo. And even that doesn't work. 
<laughs> yeah. And and Frodo, you know, and Frodo just sort of like, now nah, just go. And it's sort of like Saruman's like, you know, reduced to nothing. <laughs> you know, is is, is is you know, he's killed, his little shade appears for a second. <laughs> gone (laughs) that is such a bizarre moment too it's the only time i can think of not the only time but there's very few like explicitly supernatural weird moments like Mm -hmm. that and that i like as a kid being like oh my god it's such a such a departure from the rest Mm -hmm. of the book Mm. yeah that's the spirit that rises and looks to the west and then gets rid gets just totally rejected yeah he goes full like indiana jones villain he just shrivels yeah. up it's such yeah. it's so weird <laughs> uh, yeah and it is a weird you know it's also it also serves as a little after echo for sauron's fate where he's the huge yeah. towering thing that then is mm-hmm. blown away by the winds here it's you know potentially just a reduced thing but you know we could go on there something to sort of you know give a perspective to the wider chapter too is something that's very you know interesting to me and is woven throughout is the fact that tolkien has brought the scope back down down. And I mean that yeah. stylistically. And uh, we are focusing more on the, the smaller problems, even though they're you know reflections of vast, huge changes. And and one thing I like about it is that uh, we get uh, the, the humor comes back in as much as anything yeah. else. We were talking yeah. about serious matters. But I mean, you know, we just got the, you know, it's sort of the, the back and forth, like, you know, like even when they get to the gate, like, you know, hey, I know mm-hmm. you. What are you doing over here? What's going mm-hmm. on? And all that. And one of my favorite bits is easily easily when uh when uh when uh when they find sam's dad you know the the gaffer and yeah. he's sort of like you know what's what's come of his whisket i don't hold with iron mongery whether it wears well or no and i'm like that's great you know it's like we are in the shire again you know it's very much like you know you you, you like i don't know you go to college you get all a's you like everybody loves you you come home and your your dad is just like oh you're back like it <laughs> why have, why weren't you around to help me like prune this tree like, yeah like whatever. i was cleaning yeah. out your closet and there was a mess in it and it's like dad i was a, i was away i couldn't you know i was i was doing stuff uh it yeah. is it is every conversation with your parents or at least with my parents and several others that i know it, it every like it always comes down to like lawn care yeah. or, or uh, <laughs> for whatever reason uh, you know landscaping is just that's all I was I was having a conversation with my mom the other day and I was I forget what we were talking about it was like a relatively serious conversation and she was like well I'm gonna go plant some peonies and I was like don't you already have those what are you <laughs> doing okay. can we get back to what I was talking about but me but my life not even in a exciting. selfish way but like is that really the end of the conversation is you're gonna go garden like, uh, well, Tolkien would say yes <laughs> yeah actually exactly that <laughs> Ned, you so I did not uh, have enough money to shell out for I think the book in which this is contained, but there I, I saw that there there are hints of like the earlier versions of this chapter where Frodo plays a much larger, more active role. Ned, do you know about that? Have you read? Yes, I I. I... I know what you're talking about. That is in, uh, gosh, what is that one? That's Sauron Defeated, I think, is the is the book that one's in. Yeah, that was that's the, of the four books that cover the ma- the uh, manuscripts of Lord of the Rings. Sauron Defeated is the one that contains the uh, Scouring the Shire chapters, which unfortunately I did not think to reread before this episode. So my apologies there. That does strike me as right, though, um, and it is a matter of uh, of him sort of fine tuning how he how he sort of did this. Uh, you know, from you know from the perspective of the final manuscript. Of course, it had to end up this way, uh, but yeah. Uh, but uh, but yeah. I mean, it, it's one of those things that uh, you know he was you know feeling his way forward. The thing that it, that I can't remember that if it was a first introduction here or not. I'm assuming it was. Is that all of a sudden uh, Sam has a girlfriend? Yeah, <laughs> which is yeah. which is flippant to say. But you know, after but you know, the movie fixed this problem, quote unquote, if we want to consider it to be a narrative problem. But in the book, we only learn about Rosie right here at the very end, and that he's kind of sweet on her, <laughs> and it's sort of like. Well, wait, where did that come from? <laughs> Especially because Rosie is kind of cool. I like, oh, yeah. you know, she kind of Rosie gives Sam a little sass. She like <laughs> is like, you go, you know, you know, what'd you go and leave him now for? Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah talking yeah. about Frodo. It's uh, like, I kind of wish there had been more of her. Like, the, you know, of course, there's no opportunity for this. We've already discussed Tolkien's issues with women, but it is kind of a shame because Rosie is great. 
in she the is. 10 seconds we see her. And, you know, we could you could argue, you know, is this another kind of scouring? You know, the great love story as such of the book is Frodo and Sam. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> All of a sudden we're returning back to, you know, oh, well. Uh, hmm. Coming <laughs> down with the case of the not gays. Yeah. <laughs> I do. Speaking of Sam, I think it's super. This just occurred to me during recording. There's a weird reflection of his role in the scouring the shire in his ring vision when the ring is tempting him he's like samwise is the great like the gardener who mm. you know mm-hmm. makes mordor flower and bring forth fruit and he's like no that's absurd i don't want that i just want a little garden plot and then at the end of the book the shire is his garden plot it's yeah kind mm-hmm. of like by rejecting the ring there he gets his wish in a much more positive fashion which is i think is really cool i like that it is really that, lovely that mm-hmm. foreshadowing there's something too as well and this is to you know sort of re- reintroduce a certain i mentioned the humor but um there's also a real sense of for all the seriousness you get a sense of good spirit it's it's uh mm-hmm. it, tolkien introduces a sense of how being a light in the world actually uh, actually you know functions you could argue mm-hmm. in a way so uh, just sort of like you know there's the um, Mary and Pippin and so forth they're 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 certain setting up themselves but they're not doing so angrily and yeah. I think this is also almost aspirational <laughs> on uh, on uh, Tolkien's part to a degree um, one of my favorite moments in the in the chapter is when uh, is, is when uh, you know Sandy man uh, Ted Sandy was going <laughs> and is like yeah well we're coming back and he realizes oh wait what's going on and he, he rushes out and blows whatever horn he's got as a warning and the, it's Mary just sort of laughs and says <laughs> save your breath I've got another <laughs> and it's just such a I got one and it's such a sweet positive moment in a weird way that's we're sort of like oh okay you know it grows that up and I bring this up because of a quote from one of the letters that um, I uh, that actually would have gone well for our episode last year on imperialism. Uh, mm. And I stumbled across this strictly by chance. Uh, this is uh, this is something uh, when I was doing some other reading somewhere else. So this is from a letter to uh, to Christopher Tolkien in May of 1945, when the Second World War was ending, uh, formally ending. And here is here is the quote. Though in this case, as I know nothing about British or American imperialism in the Far East that does not fill me with regret and disgust, I am afraid I am not even supported by a glimmer of patriotism in this remaining war. I would not subscribe a penny to it, let alone a son, were I a free man. Now, that's a pretty heavy quote on many reasons. Yeah. And again, that would that would have gone very well uh, you know, had, had we sort of incorporated that in our imperialism episode. But playing that out and realizing that this is something, you know, written and you know, some years after that. You tie that into his own just sort of just general like uh, discourse about bad behavior all around in World yeah. War II, which I think is something that really has to be uh, and in World War One for that matter. And you could argue that something something like these moves here, he's sort of portraying as like you know, man, wouldn't it be nice if it was really like this? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The Shire is utopian. Yeah, yeah, very. It is. Yeah, everyone just kind of does their own thing and gets along without the need for government yeah. mm-hmm. of any real kind. Well, we've brought this up, I think, in passing before, where he says somewhere that his political views are like anarcho-conservative. Like, he likes mm-hmm. the old values, but he doesn't really want any sort of strong central government, no nationalism. He just wants, like, little towns farming mm-hmm. and eating plums or whatever. That's, yeah. his, <laughs> that's his ideal life, is the Shire, where there's nobody in charge. There's a mayor who has almost no power and just presides over banquets yeah. and that's like that's it that's how life should be <laughs> yeah but it's hard to disagree with him right now i mean <laughs> mm-hmm. there's a couple of other thoughts i have kicking around but uh um oriana is there anything in more particular you wanted to ask of us or uh, things you want to bring up kind of addressed most of what I wanted to talk about. Ned, what are your other thoughts? I'm curious. Well, let's go back to talking about Jackson's lack of including Mm -hmm. it or what he did with it. So just as a reminder to everybody, um, I mentioned the Miracladrial sequence. That's as close as we get to seeing what the Shire could have been, of course. And uh, that is notably more, you know, violent and destructive uh, than uh, than even the image in the mirror in the book. Uh, We have, you know, literally you've got at least one hobbit seems to be carried around 
around, spit it on a sword at one point there for a couple of seconds. And you see an, some, another sort of brutal murder happening. And then you see a vision that's meant to be of, of Sam himself. Um, actually, it's it, in the movie, of course, it's Frodo seeing this all in the book. It's it's Sam who's seeing the Shire images. But in, mm. in the movie, and you see Sam himself in a line of hobbits being just led to the to the horrible mill and then everything just, you know, mm-hmm. a blasted wreck. So that's as close as we get to envisioning what the Shire might be looking like uh, at uh, at that particular point, an extreme version of it. So that's his sort of tease. And then again, what we get, we give get back is that, you know, we just see him riding into the, the Hobbiton set, as it were. And what's her name? The, uh, the, the old, the older Hobbit lady who was uh, just, you know, cleaning up her garden again. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> she's great. I actually like she came back. It's sort of like she's going, ah, where are you been? Yeah, you know, nice. good casting, wherever that was. That was yeah, really, she's that was, the best. Yeah. <laughs> I just love her one line is just that laugh in the first movie. And then back, this just sort of like, uh, yep. you know, but we see her in the, we see her in the pub later. We see her, we see her in the green dragon later. So we know she likes a drink. So good on her. Um, but <laughs> anyway, I bring all this up because again, to distinguish it, from other dramatic presentations is that the both the American, which again, and the more importantly, UK radio series Mm -hmm. does have the scouring. Yeah, they do not leave that out at all. And I think that's vitally important. <laughs> I mean, you know, they, they, they honor the story properly. Um, it's the American one, which again, I haven't heard, listened to in decades and I'm not going to go back to it. I forget <laughs> how, how short it is, but they do do an accounting of it. It is very, very deftly done. I think in the, uh, in the, uh, UK version, it's, it's reduced as well. They don't have the extended confrontation with the gang of bullies in Bywater itself or things like that. It's more sort of yeah. like they sort of write in and realize, wait, things are going apart here and they sort of figure out what's going on. So it's abbreviated, but they do build up to the final confrontation with both uh, Sourman and Wormtongue uh, and and how it resolves in that. And yeah, by having that in a dramatic presentation, you do get a sense of you know how how that dynamic plays out in those adaptations much more strongly, and how much more central, for lack of a better words, it is. How it is functions as more than a mere denouement. You know, whereas in Jackson's version, the argument would be, yeah, which ending is it? I'm like, look, guys, I'm, I'm done with this argument. You know, I was done with that argument back then. You know? Yeah. <laughs> and, it, and I think like that is sort of a, a function, like the problem. And I, I love those movies. So mm-hmm. like, mm-hmm. you know, problem is very different from how we think of the word problem um, is Jackson's movies are typically the tone overall is very epic you get the beginning in the shire and that's like you know not as epic but you you very quickly switch out of that mode you don't get the gradual slide in or the gradual ascent i guess into high fantasy Mm. that occurs in the books i i do think that it probably would not have matched tonally uh to have this extended uh a sequence with just hobbits and you know taking taking back the shire but i i wish they had i I kind of wish they had anyway i wish you know there was there was a lot of stuff in there that they didn't need to have but this feels like a pretty big uh omission yeah like you could cut out the whole thing on the stairs where Gollum frames Sam for the right. That's just, that's invented for the movies. We could talk about that at all. Oh, other boy. Um, <laughs> we'll get to that. Could just cut that out and you have some time, you have time for something. Yeah. It's interesting to me that Jackson's vision of, you know, a bad Shire is solely framed in terms of conquest. But the book is not like that. The book is like internal issues with the Shire leave it vulnerable. Mm. to outside manipulation people people spying on each other yeah. is mm-hmm. like a big thing hoarding food all that but the like the vision in the mirror is not like oh my god everything's burned down and people are getting mm-hmm. <laughs> spitted it's trees are getting chopped down yeah the environmental damage that kind of thing it's much quieter one of the flaws of the movies i think is that it they consistently think solely in terms of interpersonal violence yeah and mm. not the environmental part that is such a huge thing in the books. I mean, you get that with the Ents, but like the books really, it's part of the DNA 
of the entire yeah. thing. And and one of the key bits in the in the scouring, thinking again on the conversation with Sandy Man, and again it, it speaks to the the layerings of what's going on in the scouring, is when the hobbits come up the bag end and uh, Sam realizes they've cut down the party tree and you know he's practically crying, it just pressing and then they're mocking laughter from Sandy Man and his comment yes. is you always were soft, weren't you, Sam? And I'm like, that's an interesting dynamic. That's not good versus evil. That's necessarily that's something yeah. else. And yeah. of course, what is also interesting is that, you know, after the confrontation happens with the rest of him, what what happens to Sandy Man? We don't know. Does the mill stay up? Does Sandy Man still stay there? He's sort of written out. You know, a, a dare I say a lesser book might have actually said like, and then Sandy Man saw the air of his ways and fled town or things like we don't get that. We don't know what happens to him. It's almost sort of like the argument is sort of like you, you triumph by ignoring him because, you know, arguably, you know, by default. You ignore you know. the darker impulses of your society and if they'll go away, I think might be the implication. Because you don't the, they don't say what happens to any of the collaborators, right? Right, right, yeah. Uh, yeah, no... all of the... <laughs> Yeah, yeah. The, the closest thing to it is sort of like I think there's a mention uh, once or tw there's a mention at one point when I think the first band of like you know it's not the ruffians but the band of hobbits who are coming to like you know have been mm -hmm. ordered to go and set things up there and sort of like uh, and they realize that you know the conversation happened. They think there's a mention about how one or two slink off. You know, it's sort yeah. of like okay, we're not involved or just sort of like you know they realize it's just sort of like uh, and it's sort of like okay, there's something interesting here because you know they just sort of milled back in commentary on collaborationism. Who knows? But, you know, it's... Yeah, you know, the, the conceit of the books is that they are the Hobbit records. This is the Red Book of Westmarch yeah. and all that. Why did the Hobbits not record what happened? Yeah. <laughs> what, what did they do to the collaborators? Is like... this Tolkien forgetting to include what happened? Or is this the Hobbits omitting what happened? Mm. <laughs> Say, Bob, what did your uh, noble ancestor do there? Uh, nothing, nothing. Yeah. <laughs> nothing. <laughs> But, uh, it was a and, and and maybe I'll throw in one last thought here. Uh, just give me an eye on the time. Uh, just one last thought here, sort of a comment, is that we get a moment of forgiveness where, of course, at the beginning of the book, if there's a really bad person or someone we're sort of, sort of, sort of focus our ire on because they're intangible is dear old Lobelia. Sackville Davis. Yes. And, you know, and here we, and, and, you know, we hear, and we hear about her secondhand um, in the story about how the, the, the hobbits there, we come back and it turns out they're all admiring her because, you know, she, she, she gave that one, the one ruffian, you know, crap, basically. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, she like hit him. hit him with her umbrella. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And <laughs> it's like all of a sudden it's sort of like, you know, it's a, it's a nice note of forgiveness. You know, the, the, the first part of the book makes it seem like, you know, she's clearly the antagonist in terms of very small hobbit and focused way or what's going on here and the way she acts and all the rest of it. And, you know, it's a crediting uh, to a character. And again, it's, it's one of those things that, uh, you know, you can argue a big theme plays out, you know, not everyone was evil in the end, not even Sauron was to, to start with, not even Sauron yeah. was. So, yeah. and uh, I, I think it's, I think it's a nice touch for this. Like, yeah, I do. It's the Lobelia, like uh, it's like two paragraphs and technically it's in the next chapter. Mm. Um, she like, she insisted on hobbling out on her own feet mm -hmm. and she had such a welcome and there was such clapping and cheering when she appeared leaning on Frodo's arm, but still clutching her umbrella <laughs> that she was quite touched and drove away in tears. She had never in her life been popular before. In in just a couple sentences, he totally redeems her. Mm -hmm. It's kind of amazing. It's mm -hmm. really cool to me. The, like the the start of the book is like all these petty Hobbit concerns, like who's going to buy a bag and all that. And then you telescope out into the, these gigantic, you know, the world ending sort of changes happening. And then by the end, you're back to petty damage, but also in a sense petty healing <laughs> like yeah. in a good, like just small things like this where the things that were wrong in the shire before the tiny things that didn't matter to the outside world now matter as much as the mm -hmm. ring did and they're getting fixed and now lobelia is popular and everybody loves her because <laughs> mm -hmm. she, she's so good hits people with her umbrella that's resistance that's <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah active yeah. resistance mm -hmm. i i mean that's oh, this suddenly just reminded me the the protests last year in seattle umbrellas became yeah our symbol mm. of mm. protest and resistance because people were using them they were there's a famous photo and it's so weird to see on like news networks that's a street that i would walk down a lot of like you know ranks of people with umbrellas mm. confronting the and it was really powerful and it's just, yeah, it's just a personal digression but you know umbrellas as symbols of resistance and protest i'm on board with it is ahead of her time 
pr- prophetic. Mobilia said Truly. all cops are bastards. <laughs> yeah, I mean this this chapter hey. really is Tolkien saying a cab. Yeah, like the first. I, I, I made a joke about that in the Slack a long time ago, but it's true. <laughs> yeah, well, like the first thing, that, the only thing Frodo does as mayor is reduce the sheriffs to their proper number, which is I th- I think it's like yeah, it's two or three per farthing, so like yeah, twelve total, and that's that's the entire At the group. most, and they yeah. just deal with like escaped animals or whatever. Yeah. They don't. <laughs> That's their whole thing. They don't enforce the laws. Yeah, I mean, one of them, one of the sheriffs who Mary talks to, you know, and is trying to be like, why are you doing this? And he's like, I don't really know. I joined this to, like, wander around the country. It was going to be fun. It was going to be nice. And now I'm stuck here. And it's like, yes, free yourself. Mm -hmm cops free yeah. yourselves <laughs> isn't he like i wanted to try all the beer and the motivations. he wants to visit all the taverns i'm, I'm down with that idea yeah. fine idea <laughs> such a hobbit motivation for joining the police <laughs> right <laughs> amazing well oriana do you want to wrap things up for us uh the topic here i i think that uh Wraps it up pretty well. Is is the scouring of the Shire is Tolkien saying a cab and uh, good night, everybody? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, it's a beautiful, wonderful end to the story, and I continue to be bummed when people adapt this story and don't do it. Okay, so now it's time to look ahead to the next episode. Topic choices come around to Jared. Jared, what are we going to talk about for next time? So I've been troubled recently by people misinterpreting things in this book. Or movies, you know, whatever. Um, And I want to talk about one of the things that drove me the baddiest. I want (laughs) to talk about Lothlorien. Like, we talked about Galadriel, but... I yeah. want to talk about Lothlorien as a concept, as a community, as its role yeah. in the story, mm. because I disagree <laughs> with a lot of things people say about Lothlorien that aren't just it's so pretty, because it is. But yeah, the, the role that it plays is really interesting and complicated and... Mm. Yes. Sounds great. Sounds good. I can't wait to hear what wrong things people have been saying about it, because I haven't encountered this and now I'm scared. <laughs> <laughs> it's not... I mean, I'll talk about this when it's time, but it's not anything too bad. It's just like, no, you're not getting it. You're okay. not getting yes. what's happening here. We'll all find out together. Yeah. <laughs> it's this kind of tree, not this kind of tree. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> so, uh, all right. This sounds you're good. You're not so... pronouncing Malorn correctly. <laughs> <laughs> That's the big problem. The leaves look like this. Yeah. They're beech Let... leaves, not maple. Oh my god. Grr. <laughs> well, we'll 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 have much to say about botany in the next episode and more besides, I'm sure. So, um but uh, in any event, very very good choice of topic. Look forward to that. Always good to do a revisit to that area and that concept. So, very good. All right. So, that will be for our next episode, which will be huh, our June episode. Man, we're almost halfway through the year. God, wow. <laughs> you know, Ooh. strange, strange <laughs> fast-moving times. We've we've done a lot. So, well, mm-hmm. uh, as always, uh, uh, certainly stay safe. Uh, certainly stay safe, and you know the craziness as things continue to hopefully get better for us all. But again, uh, you know the world is not not perfect, and uh, it has to be done step by step. Uh, but we will get there as we do. So crossed fingers. Stay well, everyone. Uh, hope you are having a good spring, regardless. And we will talk to you all next time. So until then, we'll see you. Thanks again for listening to this episode of By the Bywater. Please subscribe and rate us via your favorite podcast listening options. Episodes and show notes are at megaphonic.fm slash by the bywater, all one word. You can also message us through here. Email us at by the bywater at megaphonic.fm or follow us on Twitter at by the bywater. You can also follow us individually on Twitter and ask questions there. I'm at Vandroid Helsing. I'm at Schwinter, S-C-H-W-I-N-D-T-E-R. And I'm Ned Raggett, two G's, two T's. By the Bywater is a proud member of Megaphonic Podcast Network. Find all our fancy little shows at megaphonic.fm. We hope you join us again next time. Until then, Namarie. Namarie.